Good morning. Um, my name is Marion Hirsch, and I am the director of religious education here at the community church. I first read Louisa May Alcott's novel, Little Women, in the first grade, and it immediately became my favorite book and still is. In the intervening years, I have probably read it a hundred times. It was my comfort and inspiration through my child and youth, and it has probably influenced my life more than anything else other than my parents. A few stories about me and my deep love for little women. When we first got married, my husband and I decided to read our favorite books to each other, and of course Little Women was among the books I read to Ken, which I was soon to regret when we had our first child. I wanted to name our daughter Josephine, after Josephine March, the hero of Little Women, the fiery tomboy who wanted to be a writer. But Ken said, Mayor, we can't name her Josephine. Joe March hated the name Josephine, which, need I remind you, is why she went by Joe. We can't do that to our daughter. And I reluctantly agreed, because you can't argue with facts and logic. <laughs> so we named our daughter Sarah, which was the most popular name for girls in 1990. But Josephine is her middle name, and sometimes I call her Sarah Josephine just so I can say Josephine and remember that she carries that name like a touchstone with all my hopes and dreams for her. And another story. About five years ago, over spring break, we decided to visit New York City with our sons to see my brother and his wife, who are sitting in the front row. Um, and we left our dog at home alone, with only a dog walker to come by several times a day. Our dog was so despondent and, dare I say, angry for being left behind that in a jealous rage, he tore my childhood copy of Little Women into shreds. The rest of the house was tidy, and all the other books were intact. <laughs> Little Women Alone was totally destroyed. And I wonder how he knew which of my possessions I treasured so much. Ken says it was the thing in the house that smelled most like me. So yes, Little Women is a book I love. And I am not alone in my enthusiasm for this book. It was first published in 1868 and has been in continuous publication for 148 years, translated into 50 languages. It is particularly beloved and read by girls around the world. One of its most famous, famous fans is J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books. Rowling, who is named Joanne, has always gone by Joe, said this. My favorite literary heroine is Jo March. It is hard to overstate what she meant to a small, plain girl called Jo, who had a hot temper and a burning ambition to be a writer. At first glance, it is hard to see why this book continues to be so loved and influential. It is, on the surface, a domestic coming-of-age tale of four sisters set somewhere vaguely in New England during the Civil War. There isn't much drama, no magic, no kings and queens, no quest, no sword play. Their father does go to war, and the girls grow up in a time when gender roles were strictly defined. Women didn't vote and mostly didn't own property, and were limited in the kinds of work they could do. Women were expected and required to wear dresses, not to use slang, and not to exercise. But in this seemingly confined small story of the loves and losses and hopes of four sisters, a radical feminist and gender critique is hiding in plain sight and has given inspiration and solace to women all over the world. Little Women has always been thought to be a respectable book, 
a book that somehow encourages girls to conform and to do what is expected. But it really isn't at all. Because my dog destroyed my copy of the book, I have not read it for five years. I can't quite bring myself to buy a new copy. I'm still in denial that the physical copy that was with me and my companion through my growing up is gone. Instead of reading the novel lately, I have been reading about Louisa May Alcott, the author. I am not entirely sure why I waited until now to learn more about Alcott. It is partly because the book Little Women is semi-autobiographical. It's based on Alcott's own family. The heroine, Josephine March, is based on Alcott herself. The book has such a strong voice and authenticity, I felt as if I knew all I needed to know about the author. And to be honest, when you find out about the life of a favorite writer, musician, composer, director, you will probably find that they are deeply flawed, as we all are. And then knowing that can erode your love for the book, the piece of music, or the movie, which I have been unwilling to risk with Little Women. And since Louisa May Alcott was Unitarian, I have been doubly reluctant to find out more about her. What if she, my co-religionist, is flawed. <laughs> Many of us who were adult converts to Unitarian Universalism didn't even know that Unitarian Universalists existed when we were children. I mean, we might have heard Garrison Keillor making fun of Unitarians on the Prairie Home Companion, and we might have known that the hippie kids in our high school were Unitarians, but we really didn't know what it was all about. And then when we discovered UUism as adults, we had the experience of aha, of homecoming, of finding our people, of intense relief. This sense of, oh, I was always Unitarian Universalist, but I didn't know it. Before I learned that Louisa May Alcott was a UU, I liked being UU, but I wasn't 100% sure about it. But then when I found out that Alcott was a Unitarian, my misgivings vanished. I was euphoric. I thought, it all makes sense. Of course I'm Unitarian Universalist. Of course I am. I basked in this happy coincidence for many years without much further curiosity. But in the fast, past few months, I have been reconsidering Alcott and Little Women. This seems now urgent because we are putting on the play of Little Women right here at the church, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. And as you may have heard, we need somebody to play the role of Hannah. So I have so much to say about Little Women in Alcott. I could talk for hours. Honestly, I have 20 minutes of thoughts and reflections that I've cut from this talk that are in a separate document called Outtakes. <laughs> Choosing what to share with you is a challenge. But I think the most important thing is understanding Jo March as a feminist hero because that is what continues to be important to her readers. Jo March makes two important decisions in Little Women around which all the drama such that it is revolves. One is that Jo decides to pursue being a writer and in the context of the 1860s, aspiring to be a writer as a woman required more internal fortitude than aspiring to be a writer as a man did. Though, then as now, committing to the arts is always a risky aspiration, whether you are a man or a woman. And Joe has always been an inspiration for women who wanted to be writers. Joe's other decision which was even more radical in truth, was, not, was to not accept the marriage proposal of her best friend, Lori, a boy her age who was madly in love with her. She turns him down firmly and kindly and breaks his heart. Little Women was written in two parts, published a year apart, and from the start, the book reads as if it is going to be a romance novel. 
In the beginning of the book, Lori meets Joe, and it is clear right away that Lori is keen on Joe, and a romance will blossom. And it seems to be the point of the whole story, in fact. A coming-of-age story about a young woman is a story about her finding true love with a man, right? A true love who is handsome and rich, which Lori is. When the readers of the book were waiting for the second part of the book to come out, they were clamoring for Joe to marry Lori. They wrote Alcott incessantly. But when Alcott wrote the second half of Little Women, Joe refused refuses Lori's marriage proposal. The readers were crushed. Joe was adamant that Lori was her best friend, but she was not in love with him. And instead, Joe pursued her writing, and then to top it all off, she ended up marrying an older man who was serious, an immigrant, not handsome, not rich, a Mr. Bear. So unromantic. This still seems like an unexpected plot twist even today, a subversion of our expectations, and it crushed readers, and it still crushes readers. When I talk to people who've read Little Women, everyone talks of their disappointment that Joe doesn't marry Laurie. Yet, this is a beloved book despite that. How can an author who so disappointed readers still remain in print after nearly 150 years? The reason is, is that Jo listens to her own voice and retains her freedom. And characters who live, listen to their own voices are always heroes. Alcott marries Jo off to Mr. Bear to keep Jo free. Really, Alcott wanted Joe to remain unmarried as she was herself, and Joe often protests in the book that she won't marry. But as a matter of literary practicality, Alcott couldn't do that. For if Joe was a spinster, then little women wouldn't have been thought to be a respectable book for girls. And more importantly, readers would always be hoping and imagining that Joe would eventually end up with Lori. Alcott did not want readers believing that a woman is truly completed by marrying the right man. Mr. Bayer is unromantic and unattractive to the young reader on purpose. By giving Joe such a mate in the story, Joe is effectively free to be her own person. And Mr. Bayer is too dull a character to complete Joe, so fortunately Joe does not need to be completed. I would say here parenthetically that uh, Joe also inherits quite a bit of money, um, which also allows her to be free. Joe's rejection of Lori makes so much sense if you know something about Alcott herself. Alcott never married, and not because she didn't have suitors. She knew what many feminists at that time knew, which was that to marry was to give up all hope of independence and a career outside of caring for a husband and children. She came from an unconventional family. Her father, Bronson Alcott, was an influential transcendentalist and radical and a noted educational reformer and lecturer and writer, but he was entirely incapable of earning a living. Her mother, Abigail May, was brilliant in her own right and from a wealthy Boston Unitarian family. Her brother and uncle were both prominent Unitarian ministers. However, due to Bronson's inability to keep steady work, Abigail had to support her family, often in menial jobs. She was one of the first social workers in the United States. The Alcotts, though they were neighbors with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and were central members in the circle of transcendentalist living in Concord, Mass., they were desperately poor, often depending on charity from their more fortunate neighbors. Louisa saw from her mother's life and choices that married life was a bad deal for women with creative ambitions. Louisa resisted marriage to become a writer 
and it turned out that writing Little Women made her fabulously wealthy. She made over $100,000 on Little Women, which is an enormous fortune at that time. Alcott ended up providing for her whole family, and she never married. She wrote many books for children and some for adults under her own name, and recently it has been discovered that she also wrote prolifically under her pen names as well. She wrote Pulp Fiction secretly. But Alcott's radicalness is not just confined to wanting independence for women. Her critique of gender roles was more fundamental and it can be seen in the character of Jo March and mirrored in her own life. In Little Women, Jo is an, in open rebellion against conventional notions of womanhood. She takes a masculine nickname, Jo. She cuts her hair short. She uses slang that is reserved for men. She calls herself a fellow. She whistles and she plays rough. She is called a tomboy even at 16 when many girls outgrow that. And this is no literary accident of good storytelling or an added element of drama. Alcott often wrote of feeling like she was a man in a woman's body. When she was a child, she could run faster than any boy. And she frequently walked from Boston to Concord and back in a day which was 20 miles each way which was unusual behavior for a young woman. She wrote when she went to work as a nurse in the Civil War, I have often longed to see a war, and now I have my wish. I long to be a man, but as I can't fight, I will content, content myself with working for those who can. Alcott said this in an interview in 1873. I am more half persuaded that I am a man's soul by some freak of nature in a woman's body. I am reluctant to say that Alcott was gender queer or gender fluid or transgender as we would understand it today because I think we have to be wary about interpreting the words of people from other times and contexts. But there is no question that Alcott was radical about gender. Alcott and the other transcendentalists were not in the mainstream of Unitarianism in their time. They were a radical fringe element in many ways. They were often reluctant churchgoers because the Unitarian congregations were more often than not conservative, more conservative than they. And as Reverend Tom pointed out in his sermon about transcendentalists earlier in September, they were complicated people for sure. They had their faults but they had a clear vision of human freedom, including the abolition of slavery, women's rights and suffrage, and also a commitment to creativity and intellectual freedom and trusting your own conscience and mind. And that Unitarian ethos, once a fringe sensibility, has become central to our faith. What appealed to me as a child about Little Women was not the feminism or gender critique when I was in the first grade, at least not consciously. It was that Jo March was trying to be a good person, a person of character, a person of kindness. She was strong in her own mind and trusted her own experience and understanding of herself. And that book showed that being true to yourself is not incompatible with goodness. In fact, it's necessary for goodness. Of course, human dignity is always compatible with goodness. We start with ourselves, we treat ourselves with dignity and trust, and then we expand from there to those around us and to the wider world. So it is not a surprise to me that Jo March is beloved, not because she is a tomboy aspiring to be a writer, but because she is radically true to herself and inspires all of us to listen to our true selves. <laughs>